welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. And today on episode number 177, midweek supplemental show, uh, we're going to be talking about Bowie knives. Um, we're going to look at uh, my Bowie knife collection. I would have to say at this point, it is a sub collection and one I intend to grow. Now I'm putting some stipulations on this, uh, which we'll get to uh, we'll get to later in more detail. But uh, we're not including folders here. We're not even including um, uh, combat knives like the K bar, which is obviously a Bowie. Uh, but we'll get to all of that excitement later. Uh, we're going to do a pocket check state of the collection, and a couple of uh, interesting news items about knives. But first, uh, some knife drama. Uh, Jim noticed this morning I was a little bit late showing up to, uh, to this recording session, and that's because there was some doggy knife drama uh, in the house. See, I'm not used to dog dumb. I am used to cat dumb. And, oh, something happened with my camera here. And, uh, well, cat dumb doesn't do this. So uh, I hear my wife say, what's the little rattler? I'm like, oh no, what now with this knife? Everything about the acquisition of the little rattler has been tainted. And now, there we go. And now my dog has taken the tube, which, uh, <laughs> which is where much of the value of a Great Eastern cutlery uh, resides. And he chewed it and just destroyed it. So this is what it was. He even enjoyed the wax paper, which I enjoy too. I love this old, old-timey brown wax paper. Anyway, he totally destroyed the tube. Uh, I guess that means the little rattler is officially mine because I, I'm not going to sell it without the tube. And well, maybe it's got to cut me, and then it'll really officially be mine. Great little knife. I love it. Thanks, Argo. You dumb dog. I love you dearly. Uh, and to all of you dog people out there who are like Bob, how could you say that about a dog? I know people love their dogs, and man, it's only been a month and a half, and I, I totally love our dog Argo. But like I said, I'm getting used to that uh, that dog dumb. It is different. It is different. And uh, but he's just a big ball of muscular joy, destroying things and breaking hearts. <laughs> uh, so there we go. Uh, pocket check for today, apropos of our subject matter, which of course is the Bowie knife. Today I am carrying my. Hinderer XM24 Bowie knife. Uh, this is a folder from, this is, I guess, third generation XM24. This, I believe, was made in 2012. Uh, came to me through the through the secondary market, and then I got, uh, I got this cool micarta scale, which was already made. Someone was selling, and now, unfortunately, I can't remember who that is. I have their card in the Rolodex of knife people. Uh, but this is an outstanding knife and a real, real man. If you like hinderers and, and you like Bowies, well, what can I say? I, I, ha I have to say, I think that the length, the four inch length of the XM24 blade allows the hinderer Bowie design to fully express itself. I feel like on the 3.5 inch uh, XM18 Bowie, which is also a great knife, I feel like the design is slightly truncated and it shows, but in the, uh, 24. It's long and graceful and has a has the length to fully express its beautiful Bowie shape. Okay, enough of that. Uh, the other knife I'm carrying uh, today is a an undisclosed prototype. Uh, now, I've been watching knife videos since 2008, and at any time anyone got a prototype, I was like, oh my god, they're so lucky they get to check things out, before, you know, check the product out before it comes out. And uh, it's been a long time, but here I have that opportunity right now. Uh, I've had that opportunity a couple of times over the past uh, year and a half here, but I'm very excited. These are traditionals and uh, that's all I'm gonna say about them. But um, if you follow the podcast and listen to the interviews, you might know, um, you know, what I what I have right now in my possession. I'm just not allowed to talk about them. Ooh, doesn't that sound cool? Well, I gotta say these two knives, um, Hmm. There are one one locks and one doesn't, but they're both in the traditional realm of things, modern traditional realm of things. And I think uh, I think viewers and listeners are going to really dig these when they come out. Um, 
I know I will. And uh, they come, I believe they're coming in special leather cases, which are outstanding and gorgeous. So enough about this undisclosed prototype uh, that I cannot discuss, because that just sounds a little high-handed. And well, it's, it's boring for you, and it's boring for me, because I can't really get into the juice of it. So um, next, we're going to talk, I want to show off this. This is the Patreon giveaway knife that wasn't in my possession until yesterday. So uh, we've been talking about this and Jesse Tellis, a uh, gentleman junkie, $10 supporter on Patreon, uh, won this. And uh, let's just pop this open. This is the, uh, you'll oftentimes see people use one great Eastern cutlery knife to pop the top off another great Eastern cutlery knife. So when you get a knife uh, from Great Eastern Cutlery, this is the experience you get. Um, the tube, sometimes you get a button, 38 special, GEC. This is the GEC 38. You get this cool old wax paper. And then Jesse, thank you, sir, for your support. We'll be getting this beautiful uh, 38, number 38 from Great Eastern Cutlery and titty trim. That means it's their fancy trim. So you got those nice bolsters that beautiful green tractor jig bone and the titty Ute shield and no half stop on the 38. You get that beautiful muskrat clip blade. So Jesse, this will be in the mail to you and you will probably, oh, I'm not going to wipe that. That's got oil on it. Uh, this will go in the mail to you and you'll probably get it sometime in 2021. Uh, but I'm not going to guarantee when, because we all know how the mail has been lately. Uh, uncharacteristically awful. All right. Okay, I've been saying for a while with all the sending and receiving from doing the Knife Junkie podcast, like the people rag on the mail all the time and I, I think they've been great. And then and then I gotta say during the holiday season, who knows, maybe it's just a glut of orders or something, but it seems like all deliveries are off. So we'll leave it there. But uh, Jesse, keep your eyes peeled on that, uh, on the mail there. So next I would like to mention uh, some of the supporters we have. And uh, those are patrons on Patreon, obviously. And uh, I want to read off their names because they help make this uh, whole podcast possible with support. Uh, with their support, we can pay our fees. And, uh, and then eventually we'll have a little bit left over and we'll be able to up our uh, output excuse me, in the coming year, we want to uh, do this show in HD so that every all the images come through very clearly and uh, it will also presumably enhance uh, how our guests look as well. So uh, we're looking to do that and it's the patrons on Patreon that really help us do that. So I would like to read them out. Uh, we'll go from the, our first to our most recent. We have Brent, we have Where Is Kristoff? We have Timothy Becker, Jock, Over Across the Shock, we have Kevin Seastrom, Reed Mertz, two people who have won, uh, and Caleb Townsend. He's also won uh, a, a Gentleman Junkie giveaway. We have our good friend, Ryan, Ryan Leitner. He's Spirited Blades. Edwin Callow, our resident uh, Emerson junkie and, uh, and expert. We have Joe the Knife Whisperer, our good friend, Mike Latham, Jesse Tellis, who just won this uh, 38. We have Mr. Fidello. Filato, I'm sorry, Mr. Filato. We have Blade Ogre, Fred Lynn, Jason Knight, who we recently had on the show, and our good little buddy, Ezekiel Yates. Uh, Ezekiel and his family listen to the show, so uh, we're, we're, uh, we're really grateful to have you all along here and helping support the show. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure what the next giveaway will be, uh, but needless to say, it'll be cool. It will be sweet. Uh, coming up, we're going to have a little uh, a little perusal of the knives I've gotten uh, in the holiday season. With my state of the collection. Here we go. So a few Christmas knives, and I'm going to put them up on the knife cam because uh, these deserve a closer look. So firstly, uh, for my brother-in-law James, who's just a great guy. You know, my my wife and I were reflecting how, you know, we could, it's very possible we could not get along, but it just so happens that he's a great guy. I'm a great guy and we have an awesome thing going. Great brother-in-law. We get each other knives all the time for, 
for uh, holidays and birthdays. And this year I did not get him a knife. I don't want to be a one trick pony, but he got me this. And I love this thing. This is the Civivi Asticus. And uh, at the beginning of 2020, uh, this came out and people were, uh, uh, our good friend Alex, Alex's Knife Box, Dirk Werning, they all did uh, reviews on this knife uh, in different dress, but this same knife. And these are guys who collect, you know, very high-end custom knives and they raved about this knife. So I knew there was something to it. I never got around to getting it. And thank you, James, so much. This is a sweet knife. It's got a great blade size. I love the size of the blade. You know, a lot of Civivis are a little bit shorter than this, but it's, uh, you know, three and three, uh, three and three quarters inches long. You got that nice choil, beautiful, graceful shape, hollow ground, very thin blade. Excellent knife. Thank you, James. So I will, I will place that down. So I've, I've gotten, I got four knives for Christmas and one that's the big one for my wife. Uh, it's, it's in the mail. So we'll, we'll see when that comes, but uh, I'll, I'll save that for next time. <clears throat> next, uh, my wife got this stocking stuffer for me and my brother-in-law. It is a Gerber money clip. So you see that, but it's got, it's got a little blade, a really, really handy little sharp uh, broad and fully flat ground, quite sharp little blade. So this is a this is a nice little uh, addition to the to the bag or to the pocket. You could clip it into your pocket. This is how I was wearing it on Christmas. I opened up a lot of packages with this, and uh, also my Finch Rentley, which was awesome for the toy boxes. Uh, this right here, you can clip it in your pocket, and then you can just reach in, press that button, pull it out. You got a little blade. It's discreet, it's small, it's non-threatening, uh, but very, very useful. And if you carry cash in this modern age, you have a, uh, a clip right there for cash. Me, I'm always carrying cash, just wads of hundreds, really. That's how I do it, wads of hundreds. So uh, this is uh, from my wife. From my lovely six-year-old daughter, I got this awesome multi-tool. I've never seen one quite like it. So she really wanted to get me a tool. So look at this. Best dad ever. And, you know, I, who am I to doubt that, you know, what children say? They say out of the mouths of babes. And, and so here you have a hammer, but you also have pliers, wire cutter. Uh, you have uh, a saw and a screwdriver and a blade, and they all lock right here with this. So I thought this was so cool and she was very excited to give it to me. And uh, thank you, sweetheart. World's best dad or best dad ever. You know, okay, I'll accept it. And then from my dad, who I think is the best dad ever, I got this from our good friend, Carrie over at Off Grid Knives. This is the Backcountry Blackout. I think it's the Blackout edition of the Backcountry, which uh, I don't know if you like this. I love this when sheaths do this. It just goes flying right off. Look at that gorgeous recurve blade. I am. I saw this, fell in love with it immediately. And then uh, after hearing the interview with Carrie, my dad uh, texted me and said, Bob, I want to get you and your brother a knife from off grid. What do you want? And tell me what you think I should get Vic. So I. I gave him my advice for what to get my brother, and then I gave him my advice for what to get me, and it was this. Um, I'm in love with that blade shape. Love that blade shape. And, and am considering, perhaps, in the future, uh, maybe sharpening that top wedge. How cool would that be? But I don't want to ruin this one in particular because my dad got it for me, and it's a gift. And I'd like to leave it in its pristine state. Uh, but if I were to get another one, that's what I would do. So what I love about this knife, besides that beautiful recurve blade, is, um, which reminds me a bit of a Marlow, I have to say, um, in, in, a, in, a, in an odd way. Uh, but I love this back uh, thumb ramp, so you can, you can ride up on the blade like that. That's very comfortable. In um, saber grip, it's also extremely comfortable. Um, reverse grip. It's excellent. So this is called the back country. But to me, I think of it more as the back alley. 
to me, this looks like a fighting knife. To me, this has the has that feel. But I, I, maybe that's the lens I see everything through. Uh, but look at that. You know, it's like that uh, that air conditioning knife I had on here, the dagger. To me, it looks like a, a dagger to, to, to tradesmen that looks like a tool that they need every day. So uh, these were the four Christmas knives so far. And then there is one in the offing that uh, is also... Um, made by, well, not made by, but designed by a recent guest on the show. And uh, that's all I'll say about that. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to blow it, but I'm, I'm very excited. I'm very excited for that one to come. So uh, you better believe I'll be showing it off quite a bit. And where will I be showing it off? You ask. I'll be showing it off on YouTube. I'm going to make some videos of it and, and I will also make some pictures of it and put it up on Instagram. So uh, if you like what we do here, definitely Follow us on Instagram, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, comment, share, like. Sharing is actually a really awesome thing you can do. Send this video to someone uh, who's like-minded but maybe hasn't discovered this podcast or this show, and uh, it could help the show. You know, one, one friend tells another friend, et cetera, et cetera. You know how that goes. So uh, check us out on YouTube, Instagram, like, comment, subscribe, share, and uh, we'll see you over there. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. So today we're going to talk about two news stories, uh, knife news stories, but they're not knife drops, which is usually uh, what this uh, section occupies right here. Uh, but we're going to be talking about um, Bomba Forge. Bomba Forge, so this is something I saw in Knife News and uh, they had a chance to talk with these guys. But uh, Bomba Forge is a forge set up in Uganda by a couple of American knife makers, chief among them, Tim Troyer of Sugar Creek Forge. Now, Tim was a an episode, uh, let's see, episode 37, season five of Forged in Fire contestant, and uh, Sugar Creek Forge is his forge. And he decided to take his 30 years of, uh, of experience, and I'm sorry, not his 30 years, he decided to take his experience and go to Uganda and set up a forge there and teach people how to forge blades. This does a number of things there. It, it, it uh, brings the community together around a common cause and it's teaching people how to fish, so to speak. You can bring knives over there, but if you teach them how to make their own knives, they'll be employed, they'll have a new craft and, uh, it can really change lives and turn things around. Uh, they started with just sandpaper and files and uh, and truck springs, and uh, they have they have added a forge. Uh, they were donated a um, uh, a grinder, and uh, so they are now a full fledged knife shop over there in Uganda. And I don't I have to admit I don't know much about the troubled past of Uganda, but I do know it was troubled. I know Idi Amin was there, I guess, in the 70s, and things have been bad there. And uh, look at those beautiful kukris. But now this is an opportunity for people to to uh, have pride in their work and have work. Look at the looks on these guys' faces. Do they not look totally psyched to be doing what they're doing? So, Tim Troyer, I'd love to talk to you on the podcast about this. This is an amazing thing, and it's a great way to uh, bring... <laughs> To have something we all love, knives, bringing people together and and uh, helping. Um, not to get negative, but a, a, a bold and stark contrast happened right here in my state a year ago, where our mayor, I mean, our governor, said no to a company that was going to set up shop and make automatic knives in Western Virginia. Uh, they weren't even going to sell them in Virginia, uh, just to, to bring some... Uh, employment and uh, and pride back to a, a, a sort of impoverished area. And they said, no, nope, nope, it's not good politics. Well, look at what Tim Troyer is doing over in Uganda. I applaud you, sir. And uh, I, I applaud the people who are getting involved. Now, so many people are getting involved in this uh, that, that there's a wait list now. And what they're going to start doing is having some of the senior students start training some of the younger students. So it'll be a trainer te uh, teaches trainer sort of situation. So really impressed with that. And, uh, and I hope to speak with Tim Troyer sometime about it next. Uh, well, we can't, we can't say no to a cold steel story. And this one, 
I don't know if it's much of a story, but uh, GSM Vice President of Product Development and Brand Management, uh, Doug Mann. Now, GSM is the company that bought Cold Steel. He just came out and talked about the future of Cold Steel. And and uh, and uh, the long and short of it is, is he was saying, look, we are a compendium of, we're, we're a conglomerate of outdoor companies. Um, and we all carried Cold Steel's before we bought this company, or many of us did. And we don't want to change the character of Cold Steel. Now, some of the Cold Steel projects uh, which uh, incidentally, uh, they don't mention this in the article, but they started off as special projects, you know, the spears, the axes, the throwing implements, uh, the blow darts and all the all the the non knife stuff that Cold Steel makes. If you remember, it started off as something called special projects and you had to go to a different website and, and then it all came under the Cold Steel umbrella. Well, I think it's going back in that direction. He says uh, that Lynn Thompson will will retain uh, control over things such as blow guns and that kind of, and spears. Uh, but so, uh, presumably under his own shingle and then, um, and then GSM's cold steel. And if you notice, they already changed the logo. will uh, will continue. Now there are no plans to discontinue or halt production of any models at this time, but that's a, that's a very, if you ask me, that's a very polished way of saying, um, you know, we don't know exactly what we're going to do, so the plan isn't there. But I think it's obvious that an outdoor company has very little use for a seven and a half inch Navaja folding knife. So we'll see. Um, the company, which owns multi outdoor centric brands, planned to entry planned an entry into the knife world with an acquisition of an existing brand. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they all sort of appreciated Cold Steel, and. You know, Lynn Thompson was concerned that so many people wanted the AD10 and AD15 and other things, but I think the AD10 was the real uh, kicker for him, and he couldn't supply it. So, uh, you know, hopefully it will continue. Now, now the question is also, well, we saw Cold Steel go from entry-level materials like OS8 and uh, GRN to G10 and and um, and higher, you know, CPM steels and... and uh, um, and 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 uh, the XHP steels and such, are they going to be going back to substandard or or beginner? Uh, what do you call it? Uh, materials, and they say we have no plans to do that. But to me, that just means there's no solidified plan in motion. But but if you want to if you want to do what they want to do, scale up production. Um, you know, something's going to have to give somewhere. It'll either be in the discontinuation of models or the um, cheapening in materials. I say that with such certainty. I don't know. I don't know. But that's just that's just uh, what it seems like from my from my pedestrian perspective. So I don't know. Let us know. Let us know what you think. Tell us on the listener line. Call 724-466-4487 and let us know what you think. Um, Eventually, uh, in the next couple of weeks, I want to take all the calls that we get. I want to put them together uh, or ask Jim kindly to put together a montage and, and hear what your opinions are. And I would love to hear what you think about Cold Steel. Am I just uh, uh, crying in the wilderness? Does no one care? I mean, I know Jimmy Slash cares, but I mean, does no one else care? Let's hear about it. I want to know. Um, discontinuation lessening of materials. How, how's it going to break for cold steel? Let us know on the listener line. That's 724-466-4487. 724-466-4487. Coming up, let's talk Bowies. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. Okay. <clears throat> so, we're talking Bowie knives. I've been threatening or promising to make a Bowie knife uh, video here for a long time, and I never have because uh, for a while I was in a little bit of an acquisitory, acquisit acquisitive phase. I don't know if that's a word, uh, but it is now, uh, where I was just trying to get a couple of things that I was <laughs> kind of desperate for. Uh, and th those were the Bark River Bowies that I got re recently. Now, I was doing a lot of flirting with the Condor Undertaker Bowie, which, you know, 
It's it's great when you when you when you tell the cop, oh, I use this for work. Well, what's it called? It's called the Undertaker boy. He's like, what are, are you an Undertaker? No, I'm a murderer. You know, I, I don't know what you do with that name, but uh, I I I never ended up getting that one. I, I am interested, uh, but here we go. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna launch into it now. The first one on my list is uh, is one that I made, and I'm actually not gonna show it. Uh, because it, it happens to be actually, um, well, hang on a sec. Sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. I was being humble. I thought I've shown this off too much, but I'm going to be real. I love this thing. I made it uh, over the past year, had it heat treated by our guest, uh, guest on the show, Alex Steingraber made this handle out of micarta and i would love to see this thing made by a real knife maker i have to say uh so that's my virginia liberator bowie and it's a large um so th this is a runners up i got three runners up because what i mentioned earlier in the show is that i do not consider uh some of the bowie shaped blades that are combat utility knives to be official Bowie's. And I don't know what I mean by that necessarily, but it's got to be more towards like a quarter inch blade. It's got to be a little bit more towards a nine inch long blade. And uh, so some of these knives are are beautiful, but they just don't quite make the cut for Bowie. And I'm, I'm going to consider this one here, the one that I made in that category. It's a runner's up. This one here, the Blackjack based on the Randall number one uh, model. This is the Blackjack number uh, seven dash one. Or is it 1 7? Geez. See, uh, but anyway, uh, that is a Bowie. Beautiful clip point blade, but it's a little bit small and uh, kind of like the, uh, kind of like this knife here, the K bar, which is a really um, common Bowie knife out there. It's got that sharpened swedge, it's got that beautiful Bowie clip point shape. But it is a seven inch blade and it's smaller and it's a little bit more utility driven. So these are my runners up. It's the one of my making, uh, this Randall style knife made by Blackjack and, uh, and the combat utility knife made by K-Bar, the USMC fighting knife. Uh, great knives, but not exactly what I consider to be fully fledged Bowies. So I'm going to remove them and make way for these guys. First, now this is the Bowie knife that has gotten the most use in my life. I've had it uh, since uh, the late 90s or mid 90s, I guess. It is the Trailmaster Bowie by Cold Steel. Mystery Steel in that I don't know what they were making it out of in 19, I don't know, 95 or whenever I got this thing. Uh, but it performs incredibly. It's got that, it's got that quarter inch blade. It's fully flat ground. So in profile, it's a bit of a wedge. So you can see all the gunk on this blade. This has been batoned through many, many, many a piece of wood. This is my kindling knife for, no, I don't camp. I'd like to, but I don't. This is for the family fire pit. <laughs> this is... Plus, when we start the fire and then there's that uh, whole world beyond the firelight, I have this on my hip and I know I can, I can, uh, you know, defend myself against the saber tooth cats that, that come in and try and steal our s'mores. So that's, that's the Cold Steel Trailmaster Bowie, a uh, knife I've had a long time and uh, one that I'm proud to still be cranking on. Next is the Tops. Prather War Bowie, and uh, it's wearing a sheath I made. Now, I've made a number of Kydex sheaths, and some of them turn out spectacular, and some of them just suck, and this one is spectacular. I don't know what I did. Maybe it's the Rocky Mountain tread on this handle that makes the retention so positive and nice, but the Prather War Bowie is a... See, I go back and forth. The Prather War Bowie is just a beautiful knife. I just love the way this thing looks. The coffin style handle is a uh, classic sort of Bowie shape. Um, 
a little flared for a classic style, but then it comes up here and it has this sort of French, and frankly, I don't know the name of the knife, but if you like Fred Perrin, he is uh, he frequently makes knives in this way where the blade widens out at the choil and uh, it's actually the blade itself that acts as the guard, sort of like a chef's knife almost. Um, this has that really long clip, which to me would be, you know, of course I'm always like, sharpen that that'd be great sharpened uh and it's got a nice run of jimping here this knife i've used a bit outside i something i don't want to mar the finish too badly i know i'm being precious with it because to me this feels more like a fighting knife than a than a than a kindling knife so i've tried it with kindling and it works okay uh it is quarter inch thick up here but it's not it's not the trail master when it comes to making kindling to me this is a, a tool of intimidation and mayhem. And uh, I'm happy to have it in my collection. Next was a gift from my father for my birthday this year. And uh, he's been following the Knife Junkie podcast, so he, <laughs> he hears about what I'm interested in. And he's, and he, uh, oh, so he wanted to buy this for me. And I said, no, I couldn't possibly, okay. This is the Bark River Knives V44 Bowie. This one has the Moran style handle. They come with two different handle uh, styles. Uh, well, I should say three. Uh, two of them are shaped the same, the stacked leather and uh, sort of the wood handles and, and, uh, and other micarta handles, which have a, um, a shape more, well, more like this, more coffin shaped. And uh, the Moran style handle is this contoured sort of horse hoof profile. And it really stays, it really nestles into the hand, melts into the hand beautifully. And then if you back off uh, a little bit down here, you get a lot of leverage in chopping with this sort of curve here and this uh, bird's beak. So it's a, it's a really ergonomically pleasing handle for for all different kinds of grips. And you wouldn't think so in looking at it because it's heavily contoured, but uh, just a beautiful knife. And the V44, so it's um, based on the Marine Raider buoy that was uh, created for uh, jungle use in the South Pacific during World War II. It had this blade profile, different handle, this blade profile. Uh, and, and like this Bark River knife, it was thinner than a quarter inch because this knife was not just being used for, uh, well, it was being used a lot to cut light vegetation, jungle vegetation. You don't want something too thick because it'll be a lot to swing. It'll tire, tire your arm out. Also, uh, it won't shear as well through that light uh, uh, vegetation. So that's what they did with this. They based it on the Marine uh, Raider buoy and, uh, you know, Bark River knives. This is an A2 tool steel. I messed it up last time. A2? Yes, A2 tool steel. And uh, I think I called it O2 or A3 or something something crazy. And uh, it's a great air, air cooled um, tool steel. You do have to be careful. It rusts easily. And uh, here I have a little bit of something ha happening right there. I'm going to have to hit that with some flits. I'm not sure how that happened. I did bring this to the shore in August to show it off uh, at the shore house we went to. So maybe that started it. <laughs> most likely anyway. So I'm going to take these large, heavy, sharp, thick bowies and leave them over here to the side. <laughs> and uh, next, this one uh, was a gift from my brother. Now we're about halfway through the, 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 the Bowie collection, fortunately and un unfortunately. This one here was a gift from my brother. This is from the New Zealand company Svord. Oh, no, wait, wait, no. I take it back. This is from the Swedish company, Svord. And this is called the Von Temsky Bowie. And Von Temsky was uh, a forest ranger in the 1860s, I think it was, in uh, New Zealand. He was a guy who learned the value of Bowie knives and how to fight with them and also how to just use them as all around general utility uh, when he was working in the gold fields in California. So the story goes, and also in Mexico and in South America, learned how to fight with them. 
ended up going to New Zealand uh, when it was still a colony and uh, uh, was a bush patrol ranger. Uh, I guess, I don't know, looking for locals. <laughs> I don't know what they did, but uh, uh, he carried this knife and then had a local um, bladesmith make 30 of these for his men. And uh, I, I love that story. They were I, uh, swashbucklers, I'm sure, is, a, is, is putting it nicely. Um, very thick, very heavy blade. It's got a really sharp uh, convex edge. You can see how it how it's rounded right down to the edge. Let's see if I can get it in. It's kind of hard to see there, but uh, it's sh sort of like a sharp axe, but uh, with paper, slices right through it like it's a razor blade. So very, very... <laughs> Very beefy, aggressive, muscular Bowie knife. The Svord 11-inch uh, Von Temsky Bowie. Next, my sock drawer knife. Well, it was my closet knife for a long time. Now it's my sock drawer knife. The Laredo. The cold steel Laredo Bowie with the best sheath ever. I love these kind of studs for... Um, retention. My brother made me a leather frog that fits over this so I can wear it on my belt if I like. Uh, but I, I do prefer to just slip this in the belt and uh, it stays there. Now, how often do I do that? Eh, not too often. I have begun to bring this into uh, the outdoors uh, and use it instead of the cold, uh, the uh, Trailmaster Bowie. Now, the reason I did that is I, I was curious about the tang of this knife. If you if you see it looks like it's a it's a rat tail tang with a, a bolt on the end. So I went online to see if anyone had taken theirs apart, and indeed someone had. And really what it is is a rat tail tang to about here, and then it's soldered to a metal cable that comes all the way to here, and then it's soldered back onto a threaded bolt, and then it's or a threaded uh, screw, and then it's bolted on here. And so I thought that is a weird way of doing it. It seems like an expensive way of doing it. It seems like, you, you know, an extra whole bit of process there, the, the soldering and the attaching and all the, or the welding, whatever you're doing in there, instead of just having a true rat tail. To, so I thought, oh my God, this is now, now this has gone from one of my favorite Bowies to a disaster. Uh, but I took it out and, you know, thinking it might be weak and I batoned it through wood and all that. And, you know, I was just playing uh, playing games. This thing is a, a brutal, brutal brute. Uh, brutal brute. Okay, well, whatever. You, this thing can handle it. This thing can handle being pounded mercilessly through hard wood uh, without, without the tang, without any problem from the tang. Uh, the blade itself, like the Trailmaster, is very thick. Uh, this is a quarter inch, and it's also fully flat ground, and it's wedge-like. Um, it's got a zero ground swedge and it's pretty sharp, uh, not sharp enough to cut paper, but it will do a gouging tear on a back cut. If you're using this Bowie knife to fight with, and that's this design, this is a fighting Bowie knife, uh, with that sort of slender, uh, a, a slender blade with the, um, spine and the edge and parallel lines and, and that long, Swedge there, uh, but obviously most people don't use this for that. Now, the one thing is, is when you're using it to baton through wood, uh, this swedge is a bit sharp and you will destroy your baton. So don't use a precious one, <laughs> have a couple close at hand. So the Laredo Bowie is not only a, a, a great menacing looking uh, fighting Bowie, but it is strong enough to handle being battered. Uh, incidentally, this is a two steel and I put a beautiful, uh, I think it's beautiful anyway, uh, patina on it with uh, vinegar when I first got it. Okay, next is the, what I consider very, very, very beautiful and classic SOG. This is the Super Bowie. Super Bowie being uh, an inch longer in blade, uh, blade length than the regular traditional bowie. Beautiful, first of all. All of these have gorgeous sheaths. I love this SOG sheath. It's very stout. The leather is gorgeous. But look at this blade. 
to me, this is, uh, I mentioned how the combat utility knives kind of didn't make the cut, but this one uh, I, I, I just had to put in. I just had to put in, it does fall in that category, but since it is larger than its original combat utility uh, cousin, and the largest in the line of this particular blade shape. This is the Mac Sog, the Mac V Sog blade shape. Uh, I, I just had to include it. To me, it is stunning, and uh, <laughs> always been a big fan of this double peaked spine here. Uh, you have Aus Eight steel. You have enough room here on the Ricasso to to choke up like this. Um, it is hollow ground, extremely sharp and you have that beautiful stacked leather handle. The finger grooves are perhaps for a slightly larger person than myself, but I think what they did was take the six inch, uh, the regular size Bowie and just literally scale it up in every way without necessarily much accommodation for ergonomics or changing the ergonomics. Love that knife, the SOG Mac V. Uh, Super Bowie by Sog. Uh, the next one, another gift from my brother. Now, this one we did a little bit of research on, and it says W.J. McElroy, 1863, putting this at the beginning. Oh, uh, Macon, Georgia, on this side, making this, you know, a Confederate Bowie knife from the first year of the Civil War from Georgia. Uh, Looking at this, uh, okay, my brother got this for me for Christmas last year, and he said it does have a, you know, kind of a spurious history. We're not sure exactly uh, what the deal is, and by we, I mean the guy he bought this from. He's gotten a lot of uh, uh, bona fide antiques from, and and this one here appears to be a very nice old reproduction of a Civil War era uh, Confederate Bowie knife. I don't think this is the real deal, even though it's stamped. I'll see. There we go. Let's see. A lot of people have, look at that wonky W and everything. 1863. Sorry for this. Uh, this hangs on the wall behind me. So. And Macon, Georgia. It's got a very thin blade. Not very thin, but it's got a, what is it? About an eighth of an inch blade. So, uh, and this really cool handle with many, many pins. The brass, or what is this, brass or copper? I don't know, it kind of smells like a Pakistani fixed blade, if you know what I mean. It has that sort of, uh, it has that sort of odor to it, but I don't think it is just looking at the blade. So this is kind of a mystery knife, but I love it because of the design. I love it because my bro gave it to me, my brother, and I, you know, just think it's a, it's a cool gentlemanly Bowie. Well, these are all very muscular and, and aggressive. This is like, this is something you get in a parlor knife fight with, you know, not on a sandbar, in a parlor. The Western W49. Sorry, I, I took this out of order. Here, let me let me move some of these gorgeous Bowie knives so I can show this thing off. Oh, there's such a dangerous and precarious pile of Bowies to my right. <laughs> It's a good problem to have. So this, uh, another one I got from my brother. This he bought for himself, and I sort of uh, just kept hinting that I wanted it, and he ended up giving it to me just to shut me up, I think. But he got this. This is a Western W49 Bowie. It's a classic. Uh, a number of different companies have made these through the years. Western, chief among them. Uh, this one my brother got in a pawn shop. And the person who pawned this had a uh, made a bone handle out of it, or made a bone handle for it. And what's eerie to me is I have no idea what kind of bone this is. And uh, you know that's where my mind always goes. It goes to the darkest alternative. So um, it's got an anonymous bone handle and a uh, carbon steel blade. It's got this great uh, um, brass guard that someone hammered down a little bit. And I wonder if they hammered it down on purpose or if it got bent, but I've tried to hammer it back. And this is so thick that I think it had to have been on purpose unless it fell from a building and landed just exactly on that quillion and then fell over to the side because 
no damage to the blade. Anyway, so hammered down like that makes me think, did the person who have this use it or think he would need it and hammered it down? I just love that about getting old used knives. You don't know what the history is and you can imagine and probably imagining is way more interesting than the actual history. This one is labeled Western USA W49D. That means it was made in 1980. In 1977, they started a dating system where uh, starting with A, 1977 was A and so on. So the D is, uh, is for dating, dating the, uh, the knife and that makes it, puts it in at 1980, right? 77, 98, 99, yes, 1980. I have to use my fingers, uh, that's just how it is. Lastly, but not leastly, but quite, quite beastly is this Bark River Knives Shining Mountain Bowie. Now let's pause for a moment to look at the beautiful leather work. I mean, Bark River Knives always has gorgeous sheaths. This time when I ordered this, uh, I ordered this from DLT, I believe, uh, I asked for it. They always have the option of, of coating the leather with, um, with water retardant. And this is without it and that's with it. And I, it's so rich and beautiful. Uh, the color of that leather, once it's treated, is just oof, breathtaking. So this is the Shining Mountain Bowie. And uh, this, uh, I just think it's, well, I think it's amazing. And I think a lot of people do because I took a picture of this and uh, put it up on the web and uh, on, uh, on Instagram. And a lot of people ask, what is that knife? What is that knife? A friend of mine at work asked me to bring it in. He saw it and he's like, my God, what is that? And uh, just look at it. I mean, it's a very impressive knife. Uh, I've had people say it looks like a pirate knife. To me, it looks like the Bowie knife that Brad Pitt carries in Inglorious Bastards. Uh, of course, he has his with a stag handle, which would be really cool on this. Um, but it's that it's that uh, up sweep of the spine, and then the, it's kind of like a broke back sax, if you will. And and uh, and then it's got that huge belly. <sighs> Look at that big, thick quarter inch slab of A2 tool steel. And then let's look at this stacked leather handle. They make a regular stacked leather handle and then they make this. This is an antiqued. Here, let me, let me flip this around so I'm not. This is an antiqued stacked leather handle. So they, you know, once it's put together, they stain it in some way to make it look old. And um, mm, I was just so pleased with the with the look of this. I ordinarily uh, drift towards the um, the Moran style handles. This I saw this and uh, it just called to me. Very compelling, and it feels great in hand. Now, to me, this is uh, this is the knife that a bigger man would carry uh, all the time because it's so damn big. <laughs> but uh, I love it. It's a prized part of the old Bowie collection. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy that this year I've had uh, the good fortune to get so many, so many great knives. I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at all this stuff here in front of me and I'm thinking, wow, you know, I'm a lucky guy. So I am a lucky guy. And a lot of that has to do with you all listening and watching. Um, I wouldn't keep doing this if you weren't listening and watching. So I appreciate it. And um, you all, give me the perfect justification to go out and buy all these ridiculous Bowie knives uh, that I don't use, but that I, that I cherish. And uh, someday my daughters will receive, they'll be like, Oh, great. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta go through this whole collection. Um, so anyway, that has been my Bowie knife collection and I'm grateful that you stuck around to check it out. What do you think? Are you a Bowie knife fan? To me, it not only has the perfect, shape for many, many things, uh, utility, uh, to, you know, camping chores, to fighting, to all of the things you would want, uh, a knife to do, but also it's got a beautiful American history. It's got a heritage. It's got a really cool story. And yes, we saw Bowie shaped blades throughout history before, uh, 
Jim Bowie and the Bowie knife. Uh, but the way the Americans took it and ran with it and turned it into a national symbol and uh, just a, uh, a, a great knife that deserves reiteration over and over. Um, well, I consider it a fully American knife. So there you have it. In this coming year of 2021, I do hope to get something else that Bark River will be putting out. It's not quite one as as huge as these other two Bark Rivers I have. It's the Boone 2. Okay, I'll say it. The Boone 2 is coming out this year, and I look forward to getting that and adding that to this, to this Bowie collection. So uh, I want to wish you all a very, very happy new year, as does Jim. Look at that awesome graphic. I love what he's been doing lately with this show. It's really looking... It's looking miles and miles and miles and miles ahead of where it was, even when we first started going visual, and uh, certainly from when we uh, first started the podcast. So, Jim, thank you for everything you do, and thank you all the listeners and viewers uh, for, for tuning in. It's great to have you. I really appreciate it. 2021 is going to be a better year. Uh, we all know that for sure. And uh, it will bring us all uh, a new perspective on knives and a whole new bevy of things to talk about uh, this, this coming week. I got something cool coming in, which I'm going to be talking about quite a bit. So that's me saying uh, for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, happy new year, happy holidays, have a wonderful 2021. May it be healthy and prosperous for you and uh, those that you love. Thanks for watching, and don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast.